Good morning, Winfrey Church. Hope you're doing well today. I was thinking and praying about devotional, and gosh, what could I say? You know, uh, what a crazy week it's been, and um, been praying a lot the last two days, two three days, uh, about what the Lord wants me to share. And uh, last night felt like I finally got some kind of an answer. Um, and it was in the form of this little phrase I want to share with you today. The church is called to profess even more than it's called to protest. The church is called to profess even more than it's called to protest. Now, what do I mean by that? So John chapter 11 is where I want to look at today. John chapter 11 is the story of Lazarus who has died and Jesus has gone to raise him up. And I'm gonna start here in verse 33. Jesus gets on the scene, goes out to the tomb, and it says, when Jesus saw her, Mary, weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Now, I've heard that story many times throughout my life, and I've heard it taught many times. And a lot of times I've heard uh, it taught that Jesus wept because he was sad about Lazarus dying. And it's a way just to kind of show that Jesus had these human emotions like we do. And yes, Jesus did have human emotions like we do. Um, but I think there's so much more to it than that. I don't think it's that Jesus is weeping just because Lazarus is dead. And the reason I say that is because there's so much in the story that tells us Jesus knows he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He told his disciples, he tells Mary and Martha who are struggling to believe um, that he is the resurrection and the life. I mean, Jesus knows he's going to raise him from the dead. So why is Jesus weeping? Now, another reason could be it's just because he's showing solidarity with the other people who are weeping and, and you know, mourning with those who mourn. And, you know, I, get, I guess that could be it too. But what I really see in this is, um, and, and part of what cues me into this, um, uh, this deeper reason, is because it doesn't just say Jesus wept. In verse 33, it says he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled, right? Um, that doesn't sound like somebody who's just weeping because you know he's he's sad that somebody died who he knows he's going to raise from the dead and what i see here is jesus there's another story uh when john the baptist is killed jesus goes away to a quiet place and when he comes back uh, the crowds find him and he looks on them and it says he sees them and has compassion on them because they're like sheep without a shepherd and the same idea i think is applying to this story here Jesus looks at all these people who are weeping, who are experiencing all this grief and anger and fear and all the emotions that come with death. Um, and he looks on them just like he looks on the crowd. And he, he sees people that are hurting and have no hope. And Jesus knows that he is the answer to that. He's told Mary and Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And there's so many places in the Gospels where it says Jesus has this similar experience. He's troubled. He's disturbed. He was with his disciples and he's like, how long do I have to bear with you guys? He's, it's like he's looking at the human condition everywhere he goes. And he's, he understands this is not the way it's supposed to be. But he understands something that they don't know. He understands the power of the kingdom of God that he came to bring into the world. And he's troubled, he's disturbed because he's seeing all these people who have no hope and they're fearful and they're angry and they're, and they're mourning and in all these situations, they have all these needs. People are sick, people are dying, people are hurt. And it, it's not that he sees it and he's just hopeless and he's thinking, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do with all these people? Uh, nor is it that Jesus just sits with them and hangs out with them in their pain. You know, if Jesus just came to sit with us in our pain, I mean, the cross didn't really do much, did it, you know? Jesus came to bring a divine solution to the problems of the world. He came to bring the kingdom of God. And so when he sees all these people who are living with no hope and, and experiencing all these things, it troubles him. It troubles him because he knows something that they don't know and he, he longs, it's like when he says to Jerusalem, so Jerusalem, I've longed to gather you like a hen gathers her chicks under my wing. 
I just, I want you to be a part of this kingdom. I want you to understand what I understand. And when it says in the other story that Jesus had compassion on them, you know, it says he taught them. Other places where it says he healed all their sick, he brought the solution to them. And that's kind of what I mean when I say the church is called to profess even more than it's called to protest. Protesting is, and especially if you're not a part, say in this situation, of the African-American community and you can't empathize with the pain that's, that they're experiencing because you haven't experienced that same situation. Um, there's all kinds of places that talk about mourning with those who mourn and that's a part of, uh, of what we're called to do. And protesting is, is a part of that. Um, it's showing solidarity, it's showing empathy, it's showing sympathy, and there's a place for all that. But what Jesus came to do is to bring the solutions. Jesus came to bring the power and the love and the effect of the kingdom of God everywhere that he went. And you can see it in story after story after story in Jesus' ministry, the woman at the well, all the people he heals, even the religious leaders. I mean, he's coming to, to stir things up and to show them that I am here and I'm gonna bring the solutions. And I think that's so important for us. You know, I'm sure a lot of us in everything that's been going on, you know, you're asking, what do I do? What's my part? in all this, right? And I think it's a lesson for us that we need to go to the Lord, we need to ask Him what our part is, and we need to realize that our part as believers has to include God. I am all, you know, political action and social action, those things, you know, have their place, but if you think about it, those are human uh, attempts to solve a problem. And we keep coming back to a lot of the same problems if you look at history over and over and over again despite political action that's been taken despite social action that's been taken it doesn't mean it doesn't have a place but man compared to the kingdom of god the kingdom of god is so much more powerful and that's why the new testament talks about the kingdom of god in such definitive ways it says the kingdom of god is this pearl of great price it's so valuable because it's so powerful and that's what God calls us to do, to profess the kingdom of God even more than to protest the things that we see that are wrong with the world. Now, what does that mean for us? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna close with this. Um, how do I do that? Well, Jesus, Jesus gave us a clue here in Isaiah 61. When he started his ministry, he got up, read from the scroll, and he read this here. And this is as true for us as it was for Jesus. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me, is on us too because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. I mean, that last part is really powerful. All of this tells us what we are to do. Now, for you, what that means is you go to, to God and you ask him, what do you want me to do to bring your kingdom to bear on someone's life? Now, that can be in regards to the situation that we're seeing here regarding racial reconciliation and there's a place and a, and a thing that God has called you to do to play your part in that but this can be to your neighbor this can be to somebody in your family who needs the power and the love of God and and that's really a big point that I want to make it's not just coming to to be with somebody it's not just coming to be nice to people it's coming to bring the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God includes love it includes hope it includes faith. It includes power to solve, you know, to solve problems with God's solutions. So go to the Lord and say, God, what's my call? What do you want me to do? Who is it that you need me to go to to bring your kingdom? And then go into that place, that person's life, that situation, and be the kingdom of God. So, for instance, when you go, say it's a family member that really needs help right now, and you go to them and and you say, I'm going to pray for you. Stop right there and pray for them in that moment. Pray over them. Don't just say, I'll pray for you and I'm gonna go home and maybe I'll pray for you and maybe I won't, you know? Really take action to do something concrete 
that shows that this is what Jesus looks like and I want to give him to you and this will change your life. And when we do that, man, that's how the world has changed and that's how Jesus changed the world. So ask the Lord what he wants you to do and, uh, and then go do it because the kingdom of God is powerful. Have a great weekend.